Hello everyone, welcome back to our Friday evening live stream uh, and welcome back to our virtual planetarium. Uh, if you're joining us uh, for the first time, welcome. We're going to do a little tour of our night sky, hopefully answer some questions from our audience. Uh, and if you're returning from last week, uh, thanks for stopping by again. Hopefully you'll learn something new. I've um, got some new stuff planned for you today uh, and hopefully we'll have even more time to answer your questions. So excited for that. Um, before we get started, I'll introduce myself. My name is Patrick. I'm the Planetarium Specialist at Union Station, uh, and I am uh, your Virtual Planetarium Specialist with our Virtual Planetarium today. Um, and uh, we're just kind of wait for some folks to join us. Um, while we're waiting, uh, I do want to answer uh, some questions that we got last time. Um, one great question that uh, Brooke asked last time is how I got this job. So I've been uh, working at the planetarium over at Union Station for about seven years now uh, and um, I uh, have a lot of different uh, interests uh, including astronomy as well as technology and computer science and things like that um, and so um, I've actually I've been working most of my life in the uh, museum world uh, at other museum projects like children's museums and other science centers um, and so uh, this job at the planetarium just sort of merged my personal interests with my work skills. Uh, and um, I was introduced to uh, the folks who worked at Science City uh, back a long time ago, feels like now, and um, found out about the planetarium and been working there ever since. So uh, hopefully we've got some folks joining us by now. Uh, so let's go ahead and bring ourselves back to our view of the sky. So um, if you weren't here last time, we are looking at a lovely piece of software called Stellarium. That's a free piece of software you can download on your uh, Windows PC. I think there's a Mac version as well. Um, but uh, you can see I've uh, made ours a little fancy with a little view of the Kansas City skyline here. And this is our current sky, sun setting low in the west. We're sitting on the steps of the Liberty Memorial at the World War I Museum and Memorial right behind us and look we can already see something interesting in our skies right now our moon there is the moon the moon is in a waxing gibbous phase right now waxing means that it's currently getting bigger and brighter and gibbous means that it's more than half full as you can see and when it is gibbous it's usually bright enough that we can see it in the daytime sky uh, around sunset see that moon shining up there and it'll shine even more brightly in the evening sky um, uh, now I would say that you'd be able to see it in our actual skies, but uh, if you've got a view of a window right now, you can see that most of Kansas City is pretty cloudy. Cloudy. We do have people joining us from around the country or even around the world. I know some uh, international folks joined us last time, so just wanted to sh give a special shout out and greetings to all of you. Um, and hopefully you've got a better view of the night sky than we do here in Kansas City. Um, I just got a question from Jason about posting uh, a name and the link to the software. I'll make sure uh, we add that to uh, the video description um, at some point uh, or maybe uh, one of our video moderators could add that in there the software is called Stellarium but we'll get that to you um, after this show for sure so uh, this is our daytime sky but I think most of us have joined this little stream uh, because we're more interested in our nighttime sky well, luckily uh, this piece of software has a time travel function so we can go ahead and speed up time and we're going to get that sun to set out of the way. And hopefully uh, I'm a little better at driving this planetarium than I was last time. We're all still learning how to how to do this whole uh, uh, teach from home thing. So bear with you. Or give patience here. All right, there we go. So we've got sunset. Okay, some stars. Good. That's a good sign. Stars are still there. Uh, and I'm going to stretch out our field of view here a little bit more so we can see even more of the night sky. And here it is. This is our Kansas City night sky or the night sky you'll see at uh, 40 degrees north anywhere on Earth. Uh, depending on where you are on planet Earth, you'll see a different view of the night sky. Uh, and I'll talk about the main differences uh, in a little while. But just to kind of give you a tour of what you, we can see right off the bat, well, we can see all the evening stars, of course. Now, this is a simulated view of our night sky. Um, in reality, in downtown Kansas City, though you will not be able to see quite as many stars. This is mostly thanks to light pollution. 
um, from man-made light sources like buildings and streetlights and car headlights. They send extra light up into the atmosphere, which bounces off the sky, and it kind of makes the sky glow when you're near civilization. So it's harder to see the stars near the city. Uh, plus, if it wasn't so cloudy, um, it'd be hard to see the stars thanks to the moon, because the moon is also a source of light pollution. It shines very, very brightly. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're planning on going stargazing. And the moon is waning when it's getting darker after its full moon phase. That's when uh, you can see the uh, well, that's when I'd recommend going stargazing because the moon will be rising later in the evening, so it won't be messing with your view of the stars quite. Uh, so we don't have to wait for our eyes to adjust to the darkness. Normally I do that in the planetarium, so our eyes are already adjusted, our virtual eyes at least. We can jump right in. Uh, now, I like starting in the northern sky because there are a lot of, a lot of familiar patterns here that uh, some of you may already recognize. Namely, these two shapes that kind of look like big spoons in the sky. Two patterns are the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. I um, mentioned these last time as well, but I like to start sort of with the same information to kind of get everybody oriented. And the Big and Little Dipper are not official constellations. Uh, they are what we call asterisms. Asterisms are unofficial star pattern patterns. Now, there are 88 official constellations. These were picked back in 1930 by an organization called the International Astronomical Union. That's uh, the same group, group of people who recently demoted Pluto, so we can thank them for that one as well. Um, there are 88 total constellations. Let's actually just put them all up here. Uh, 42 of these constellations are animal, or... Uh, yes, 42 of them are animals. Uh, 29 are inanimate objects. Um, and the other 17 are people or characters from mythology. And... Uh, Got some art to go along with. We're gonna look at a few of these got art. But as I was mentioning, uh, the Big and Little Dipper are asterisms. They're not official star patterns. There are official star patterns that use these stars, and their names are Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, which means the Big Bear and the Little Bear. The Big Bear is kind of upside down this time of year, uh, so um, its tail is the handle of the spoon here. Uh, its body is the spoon, plus these two stars over here. And its head uh, goes over to this star with its legs extending up into the sky. There's the tail, body, the head, legs. Go ahead and... Come on, there we go. So Ursa Major, the big bear, and Ursa Minor, the little bear. Its stars are a bit dimmer, though, and harder to see, but... Maybe kind of imagine a similar pattern. Right. Yeah. So, oops. <laughs> again, we're still figuring out the controls here. All right. Uh, so, now this star right here is a very famous and important star. Its name is Polaris. Uh, it has a, a more well known nickname. It's called the North Star. Now, the reason it's called the North Star is. Um, well, it uh, always points north. You can see our cardinal directions here. Now, there are a lot of other stars that point north, so what makes the North Star so special? Um, it's a, one of the brighter stars, but it's not the brightest star in the night sky. It's actually the 45th brightest star. So why is this one the North Star if there are other stars around here that are the north? Well, to understand that, we need to fast forward time again. Travel a little bit later. Right now it's about 9 p.m. in our virtual night sky here. But if we start speeding up time and passing by uh, time and a little bit more quickly, going at about uh, one minute per second, you might notice the stars starting to move. Now, this motion is called diurnal motion, and the stars themselves are not actually moving. Something else is moving. The Earth. The Earth is moving. And the Earth is rotating around its axis, sort of spinning around like a top once every 24 hours. And since all of us happen to be on Earth right now, from our perspective, it kind of looks like the stuff in the sky is moving it up even more and you'll see the pattern here because it's not moving randomly you can see it's actually rotating around our night sky however there's one star that's not moving and that is of course Polaris the North Star is so special because it is because it is the only star that doesn't move it stays in pretty much the same place all night long but no matter where you are on earth and no matter what time of night it is you can find that North Star you can always find North because the North Star always points before the sun rises again, let's bring ourselves back to our star tour time. About 9 o'clock. Go. Okay. So. 
Oh, that's uh, the constellation Draco. Go ahead and hide that though. There you go. Okay. Now, last time uh, I started going towards the west, so this time I'm going to go towards the east and hopefully catch some stuff that we missed during the last star tour. All right, and this is kind of fun. There's a constellation that's right next to the moon. In fact, it kind of looks like this constellation's taking a bite out of the moon tonight. It's constellation Leo the Lion. You can find Leo by using another asterism. This one looks like a backwards question mark or a coat hanger hook. This is uh, the lion's mane and Leo's body here. It's front paws go towards this direction, and then here's its tail. It looks like he's lying down. Normally, in a real live star tour, I'd get so many laughs for that, so I'm going to forgive everybody for being, uh, giving me virtual laughs. So, Leo the lion here. Uh, let's turn on solution art. There it is. Yeah, it does kind of look like it's taking a bite out of the moon. Uh, traditionally, Leo represents the Nemean lion. This was the ferocious beast that Hercules fought and defeated during the first of his 12 labors. Uh, Hercules' story is kind of a sad one. Um, Hercules was the son of Zeus, the king of the gods, um, but he was the son of Zeus and a mortal woman. Zeus had this bad habit of coming down to Earth to, let's say, socialize with humanity, and sometimes this produced offspring. Now, Hera, Zeus's goddess wife, eventually found out about Hercules' existence, but by this point, Hercules was an adult and had a family, a uh, wife and children. Um, Hera became very upset at her husband um, for Hercules' existence, but instead of punishing her husband, she decided to punish Hercules. She used magic to drive him mad and then forced him to accidentally kill his own wife and kids, and uh, this made Hercules very, very sad, and he decided to punish himself uh, for the rest of his life by forcing himself to accomplish 12 impossible tasks he called 12 lovers. He's involved uh, defeating ferocious beasts like the Nemean lion or finding lost artifacts of that nature. Let's... Right. Let me just check in on questions. Uh, so, yeah, let's... Uh, we got a question from uh, Vanna who's asking about... Uh, the Zodiac constellations, and Leo the Lion is one of the Zodiac constellations. Um, the Zodiac constellations uh, stretch across our southern sky here in the northern hemisphere, and we can see them throughout the year, um, but they are, oh, you only see certain ones during certain times of year. Well, let me see if I can uh, bring this bit up. Let me, let me just try to show the constellation. So, the other line is one of the zodiac constellations. Now let's uh, take a look at another zodiac constellation. Gemini the Twins. This one's a fun one. It looks like two stick figures holding hands. These two bright stars are the stick figures' heads. One head, body, arms, legs. Here's the other head. His body, arms, and legs. These twins were named Castor and Pollux, and they were a famous pair of Greek heroes. Continue along here. Um, since we're talking about the Zodiac, uh, let me just go ahead and bring up the other notable Zodiac constellation that's visible right now. That is Taurus the Bull. You can find Taurus by looking for this bright V pattern. This is the bull's head. The bull's horns go up to these two stars, and then its body goes down here with its front legs. In Greek mythology, Taurus was actually a disguise used by Zeus. Uh, when he came down to Earth to mess around with uh, immortals. He used this disguise to notably kidnap a young princess um, named Europa. He actually used many disguises to kidnap many uh, ver or various uh, children and royalty. And uh, Europa is actually the name of one of Jupiter's moons, and Jupiter is the Roman version of the god Zeus. Turns out many of the moons of Jupiter are actually named after uh, various children that the king of the gods kidnapped. And that actually kind of makes sense when you uh, learn a little bit about planetary science, but I'm going to save that for a future frame. So the zodiac here, we can see uh, three of them, and there is another zodiac constellation that will be rising kind of behind uh, Leo. In fact, we can start to see it. Uh, it's a Virgo the Maiden. Her head is right here, and this is one of her arms. I'll go and put it up for you. Um, so these constellations actually circle our celestial sphere. So if we had a 3D view of the Earth, and we'd be able to see all 12 zodiac constellations circling the Earth. 
That's why you only see certain ones during certain times of year. Now, these constellations are best known in astrology. Astrology sounds like astronomy, but uh, they're not the same thing. Astrology is a fun hobby that some people use, um, and uh, these constellations are known as zodiac signs, typically associated with ranges of birthdays. Um, in astronomy, though, these constellations are more closely related to the planets and their movement. Uh, these constellations follow a path called the ecliptic, which maps out the plane of our solar system. Basically, this is where uh, the line or the sort of disk around which the Earth rotates or orbits the sun. That's why these particular constellations are special. Go ahead and hide these. We're getting a bunch of awesome questions, so uh, let me uh, try to tackle those. Um, we had a question uh, a little bit earlier um, from, I uh, hope I'm getting your name right, uh, Chell. He, uh, or he is asking, uh, why doesn't the North Star move like the rest of the stars? And that's a great question. Uh, so uh, the Earth is rotating around its axis. And you can kind of imagine the Earth like a basketball spinning on your finger. Now, um, that axis is sort of a line, an imaginary line going through that basketball. Um, and so the basketball is kind of spinning around a point, right? Now that point on the top of the Earth around which the Earth is spinning is called uh, the North Pole, right? Uh, so the Earth is spinning around the North Pole. And if you stood at the North Pole and shined a light straight up in the sky, it would point at Polaris. I get how they figured out that name. Um, so that's why uh, Polaris doesn't appear to move, because relative to the rotation of the Earth, it's always in the same spot. Now, it's always in the same spot uh, for us in terms of uh, the sort of the, the span of uh, a hu typical human life, I would say. But the Earth is doing this other funny thing. It's doing something called precession. And when you spin a top on a table, it spins around really quickly, but it also does this sort of slow wobble, uh, and that is known as precession. And the Earth is actually wobbling as well. Um, and there is a way for me to show the Earth's precession on here, um, but it might be a little tricky for me to pull up. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Aha, there we go. So this is the circle of precession. So basically right now the North Pole is pointing at Polaris, or pretty close to Polaris, but over the course of about 20,000 years, the Earth wobbles. It sort of sort of does that slow, um, slow wobble like a top does. And so in about 12,000 years, uh, the Earth's North Pole will be pointing at a different star. So conversely, 2,000 years ago, the North Star was actually not the North Star. It's kind of crazy to think that even just in the span of human history, um, the North Star has really not even been that much of a constant. So uh, we had a great question from Andrew about how long it takes for moonlight to reach the Earth. Um, so light is pretty fast, right? It's the fastest thing in our universe as far as we know. Uh, and it travels incredibly quickly, about 186,282 miles per second. Crazy. Now the Earth is about 240,000 miles away, um, which doesn't seem that far, I guess, in the scheme of stellar distances, but it is far enough that light actually takes about one second uh, to get from the Earth uh, to the moon and vice versa, about one and a half seconds, really. Um, so uh, if you shined sort of a laser pointer at a mirror on the moon, it would take about three seconds for that light to actually get back here. And there actually are mirrors that were left behind by uh, the astronauts of the Apollo program that scientists still use today to measure things like the speed of light as well as the movement of the moon, because the moon is actually getting further away from the Earth every year. So great question, Andrew. Let's see. So, uh, let's go ahead and continue. Um, I'm actually gonna fast forward time just a little bit later, um, because we're kind of treating this as sort of a spring star tour. And there is an interesting asterism in our spring skies. Um, although I'm now realizing that uh, that our Liberty Memorial might be hiding it. So let's actually see if we can uh, let's let's go ahead and just switch to a different um, there we go. So this is just sort of a more uh, level playing field, I guess, for us to see. Or of the stars, at least the ones that were hiding behind uh, the pretty memorial there. All right, so um, there is uh, a 
asterism that is rising this season called the Spring Triangle. Um, and it's made of three very bright stars. Uh, one of them is the tail of Leo, called Denebola, which means tail of the lion in Arabic. Now that is that star right there. Let's uh, go turn those off, though. So that is Denebola. And then we also have the star in the hand of Virgo, which is Spica. Spica means ear of grain in Latin. And many uh, typical or traditional depictions of Virgo showing show her uh, holding an ear of grain. So it kind of makes sense that she's constellations holding Spica, right? Uh, and then this last star is Arcturus, which is uh, one of the brightest stars in the night sky, the second brightest star in the northern hemisphere. Part of a constellation called Buotes, which kind of looks like a spilled ice cream cone. Um, let's go ahead and. <laughs> there we go. So that is Buotis. Buotis was a shepherd or a hunter in different mythologies. Uh, so these three stars make up the Spring Triangle. The spring Triangle is an asterism that ancient people used to help them figure out the changing seasons. Basically, the way this works is that whatever position the Spring Triangle is in right after sunset, that tells you what season it is. So if you see the Spring Triangle um, starting to rise later in the evening after sunset, then that means uh, the Spring is approaching. Once you can see all three stars already up after sunset, that tells you spring is here. And when the spring triangle is high overhead after sunset, it's summer. When it's setting in the west after sunset, fall. The spring triangle has maybe a more famous uh, older sibling, the summer triangle. Uh, and that one more people have heard of. But there are various sort of shape asterisms for each season. And spring triangle is one of the more notable ones. Uh, kind of missing our view of Kansas City. So let's see if we can bring it back. We're doing that. Let me check to see if other questions have come in. Ooh, Ooh there we go. <laughs> We're doing this live. Uh, all right. So, ooh, great question uh, from Hillary. How fast does the Earth spin? Uh, well, spin is all, or movement is all relative in the universe. Um, but uh, the Earth, uh, at the equator, the Earth rotates at a speed of about uh, a thousand miles per hour. Right. Cool. Okay, so Kristen's asking which star will be the next North Star. Um, now, there are a lot of stars that are uh, of various brightnesses around here. Um, so that's a hard question to answer, and it might, uh, might be one that just culture kind of answers as time goes on because different stars have different meanings for different people. And the North Star is nice right now because it's part of the Dippers, which are pretty famous culturally. Um, I will tell you, though, that a uh, bright star named Vega will be the North Star in about 12,000 years, and that's a pretty notable star, one of the brighter stars in the night sky. Oh, great question from uh, Katie. Uh, her, well, her son Ben is asking, uh, uh, Ben would like to know how long it takes light to get from the North Star to the Earth. That's a great question. So the North Star uh, is, we can actually look at some information and another cool feature of Stellarium. Uh, so let's see that. Right. Here. Patience, folks. Um, will you... Ah, here we go. So, here's information about uh, Polaris here. Um, so, uh, again, the question uh, from Ben, how long does it take light to get from the North Star to the Earth? Well, first we need to figure out how far away the North Star is, and our program here will be able to tell us that. And right here, so it looks like uh, the distance to Polaris is about 432 light years, give or take uh, six or so. Um, now, a light year is the uh, amount of a distance light can travel in a year. Again, the fastest thing in the universe. Um, so the light that we're seeing from Polaris is about 432 years old. So uh, Polaris, if we had an extremely crazy awesome telescope and could zoom in all the way to, you know, 
planets, if there were any planets around it, we would actually be looking back in time in a way because that light has taken 432 years to get to us. Um, but that's a really great question, Ben. Thanks for asking that. Okay, so um, we're getting a lot of awesome questions and that's really great, guys. But I just want to, uh, I'm going to uh, check in on one last stop on our uh, star tour. I wanted to mention planet Venus. Venus will be the brightest point of light in the night sky. It'll be shining very, very brightly in the west, and you'll even be able to see it before the sun finishes setting. It's so bright. Uh, Venus, uh, you can tell as a planet because unlike stars, planets do not twinkle. Planets are a lot closer than distant stars, so a lot more of their light is reflected towards us, and they're not disrupted by our atmosphere. Stars are so far away, only a tiny amount of their light passes through our atmosphere, and our atmosphere, the gases in our atmosphere, causes that little light I'm distorted, making it kind of wobble and twinkle. Uh, so you'll be able to see Venus in our evening sky uh, tonight. Now I wanted to mention, so um, for these live streams, we're starting out with just a general star tour and we'll be answering questions throughout that. But uh, over time, uh, we're gonna try uh, to dive into different topics in more detail. Um, and uh, we are working on doing a solar system tour, uh, hopefully sometime next week, so stay tuned for that. Um, and the schedule for our live streams uh, will be uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 6 p.m. at this time. And um, that's subject to change. Just be sure to keep an eye on our Facebook pages, um, and uh, we will post information about that. But like I said, uh, I would like to do a uh, solar system tour at some point. So what we're going to do right now is we're actually going to switch to a different piece of software. Um, and this piece of software is called Space Engine. Now this software is not free. Um, you can purchase this software, so I just wanted to throw that out there. But Space Engine is a simulation of our entire universe in 3D. Um, and it simulates all the known stars, planets, and galaxies. Um, and it even, uh, if you want to, can simulate sort of unknown stars and galaxies and planets I'm using something called procedural generation, which is just basically a fancy way of saying um, math, basically. Uh, predicting what planets would be around certain types of stars and things like that. So let me go back to my other screen here. Uh, and this is Venus. We've got Venus in three dimensions here. Venus is the second planet from the sun. You zoom out here, we can see all the planets in our solar system. Now, because, because Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth is, uh, that means uh, it'll always appear in the early morning or early evening sky. That's why you sometimes hear it uh, nicknamed the morning star or the evening star. And uh, also because Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth, we also always see Venus in phases, which is kind of cool. So let's come back in on Venus. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and go to it. So Venus is often nicknamed Earth's sister planet. It's about the same size as Earth, has a solid rocky surface like Earth, and it has an atmosphere like Earth. It has clouds and weather patterns, and it even has rain. Now Venus's clouds are much thicker than Earth's, and we can see here um, some details in the clouds, but they're so thick that we can't see the surface uh, from uh, space, and we do have, we have sent probes to Venus to photograph its surface. Um, we can use radar imagery to peer below the clouds, and we have actually sent a few landers to the surface of Venus, uh, and those explorations of Venus have revealed that it is actually a barren wasteland. Our sister planet uh, is a bit different from us in some important ways. It is actually the hottest planet in our solar system. Even though it's not the closest to the sun, those dense clouds have caused a, run a runaway greenhouse effect, which has heated the surface of Venus to over 900 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the day and nighttime, so very, very hot. Uh, atmospheric pressures are hundreds of times that. The pressures on the surface of Earth uh, and that rain is made of sulfuric acid, so not a place I'd recommend it. But this is just a little taste of uh, what we'll be doing with a solar system tour. We can have a, we've got this full simulation of our uh, solar system and we'll be taking a look at all the notable planets as well as some fan favorite dwarf planets, hopefully in the near future. But again, just stay tuned uh, to our schedule uh, for uh, those future tours. Um, we're just, uh, we're taking your feedback as we're going through this uh, and getting a feel for what everybody is enjoy enjoying. Uh, we had a survey posted, and that's where we landed on the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday dates. Uh, but those uh, times are subject to change, and we'll adjust that 
um, as uh, you all chime in on when you'd like to watch and what you'd like to watch. But the next content we'll probably be doing will be a solar system tour. We'll be also be mixing in these star tours uh, throughout as well for those of you who missed it. Um, I do want to shout out uh, some of the content that's going up on our Facebook pages, uh, some of the other content. Um, uh, the rest of the Science City team have been posting really awesome uh, instructables, um, different uh, crafts and activities you can do at home uh, that are all science related. Uh, and I wanted to specifically shout out one that was posted today, uh, making a planisphere. A planisphere is a star map uh, that you can make at home. All you need to do, all you need is a printer, print out two pieces of paper, and then you just need some scissors and tape uh, to put together a star map that works any time of the year, which is pretty cool. You can figure out what the stars are gonna look like on your birthday. Um, so be sure to check that out and download that and make a planisphere and post your pictures of your planisphere if you'd like. Um, and uh, that wraps up the main co uh, content I would like to talk about during this star tour. I'm going to look through questions and hopefully answer some more. I know we're going a little bit long on this uh, stream. Thank you all for sticking around, uh, anybody who still is. And uh, let me jump in here. So uh, Denise is asking how many animal constellations there are. There are 42, uh, so there are 88 total constellations. 42 are animals, 29 are inanimate objects like compasses and ships. And a lot of the Southern Hemisphere constellations are based on um, explorers. So a lot of uh, telescopes and compasses and things like that. Um, and there are 17 that are sort of figures from mythology. Let's see. Heather's asking, why are there different shades of blue in the night sky? Uh, oh, or the, uh, Brevin is asking that, I'm guessing. Okay. Um, so uh, why are there different shades of blue in the night sky? Well, um, the daytime sky is blue, uh, mostly due to uh, the refraction of light through our atmosphere. Um, and uh, as the sun is setting, uh, that blue color will change a little bit. Um, if you're asking though why there are shades of blue stars in the night sky, that, that may be what you're asking for. So there are uh, a lot of different stars have different colors and those colors, uh, I talked a little bit uh, during our last live stream, um, the colors uh, actually tell astronomers a lot about distant stars. Um, blue stars are very hot stars, which usually means they're a lot younger. Red stars are a lot cooler stars on their surface at least, at least and they're usually a lot older. Um, Karen is asking, uh, what is the name of the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere? That star was Arcturus. Uh, and uh, actually, let's um, let me back to this and let me bring back up. That reminded me I wanted to teach you a quick thing about how to find Arcturus in the night sky. There's a cool little uh, trick you can use to find uh, both Arcturus and Spica and a little saying you can remember while we're loading up Stellarium. Again, about that. Okay, so going back to our eastern sky. Let's get back to our whoop, night sky bar. Okay, so um, so there is the Big Dipper right here uh, towards the northeast right now. Uh, you see the handle of the Big Dipper? It kind of makes an arc shape. Well, if you extend that arc across the sky, it points right at Arcturus. And if we were to uh, actually rewind a little bit because you can just barely see this star <laughs> button to make it back to the time. Um, okay, so Spica is another notable star, part of Virgo over here, and we can just see it barely above the edge of the memorial. Um, the little saying you can use to remember is arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica or spike to Spica. So follow the handle of the Big Dipper and arc to Arcturus speed on to Spica, and you can easily find these two bright stars. Okay, let's see. Uh, Hillary's asking, when will the next lunar eclipse be? Um, and I am not going to lie and say I know this off the top of my head, so Google is going to come in uh, handy. And it looks like the next lunar eclipse that will be visible on Earth will be a, uh, a partial lunar eclipse on June 5th. But it'll only be visible from Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia. The thing about eclipses is that they're very regular. Actually, lunar and solar eclipses both happen twice a year because of the interaction of the orbits of those the three objects, um, the Earth, Moon, and Sun. Uh, but the trick is you gotta be in the right place at the right time because they're only visible from certain places and many of them are often visible uh, just in, in the ocean. So a lot of people miss those. And Mary's asking, what is the furthest planet you can see with uh, a camera setup? 
Um, well, the furthest planet you can see with just the naked eye is going to be Saturn. There are only a certain number of planets visible to the naked eye. Uh, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Sometimes Mercury, depending on the sky condition. Um, if you have a telescope or a very good camera with a nice lens, you might be able to catch Uranus and Neptune, but those aren't visible to the naked eye. So the, the more no notable and famous con uh, star, sorry, planets uh, are uh, Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Um, Venus is the one that's visible in the early evening sky right now, but if you wake up really early or stay up really late, you can see actually Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars all kind of close together. Jupiter and Saturn are actually uh, getting pretty close in their appearance, and they're uh, going to be undergoing a conjunction uh, this year, which means that it'll be, they'll be the closest that they ever appear in our sky. That only happens every 28-ish uh, years, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and they're moving fairly slowly, though, so you, you'll be able to catch that, don't worry. Um, come summer or fall, you'll be able to see that in a bit of a better time. Okay. We try to get a couple more questions um, before our time is up. Ooh, great question um, from Katie's daughter, Ella. How do you calculate uh, a star or planet's gravitational pull? A very good question. Um, so gravity exists because of the interaction of uh, objects with mass in our universe. So objects that um, are any size have gravity. So humans even have gravity, but our, gra our gravity is sort of overshadowed by the gravity of the Earth, what we're standing on right now. Um, but gravity is uh, proportional to the size of an object. So the larger the object, the more gravity. So we can measure distant stars, um, and we can measure their brightness uh, as well as their color and kind of predict about what age they are and how much energy they're outputting, and we can use that, that information to kind of figure out how heavy they might be. We can also measure their movements. If a star is close enough to it to us, um, occasionally they'll be moving or they'll be orbiting each other. There are a lot of binary star systems with two stars kind of spinning around each other. Then we can use some fancy math to calculate, basically measure how fast the stars are going, um, and then use that to calculate how heavy they must be because there are certain constants in the universe that always exist between objects of mass. Yeah, Carolyn is requesting to please include dwarf planets. I'm guessing that might be uh, a uh, mention of Pluto. Don't worry, we will for sure make a stop by Pluto um, when we do the solar. Uh, Revan is asking, uh, is the moon a star? The moon is what we call a natural satellite. So there are man-made satellites like the Hubble Space Telescope that humans build and send to space. There are natural satellites too, which are just uh, things out in the universe that are naturally um, orbiting uh, other things. Uh, let's actually, we've already got it loaded up. Let's go back to Space Engine here. Um, and let's go ahead and go to the moon. Turn on orbits. Um, so the moon is uh, uh, a satellite, like I said. Um, it is orbiting the Earth. Now this is kind of a fun thing because a lot of people don't know this. The Earth is also orbiting the moon. So the Earth and the Moon are both pretty large. The Moon uh, is um, uh, actually exerts a gravitational pull on the Earth as well. So if we look at the Earth here, you can see kind of a little circle going around the Earth. Um, now this circle is showing the orbital path of the Earth as it related to the Moon. So this dot right here is called the barycenter. So basically the Earth is not stationary while the moon goes around it. The moon is actually pulling on the Earth a little bit. So as the moon goes around, the Earth kind of gets pulled by it as well. So um, there are uh, many bodies in our universe that actually sort of orbit around empty points in space. Uh, the very center of the Earth-Moon system is actually inside the Earth. But um, we can give you a tiny little uh, tease for a dwarf planet. Pluto and its moon, uh, Charon, actually um, orbit each other to quite an extreme degree, and you can see its very center uh, is actually uh, very far outside. So Pluto and its moon actually orbit each other quite a bit, and that's one of the reasons why Pluto is not considered a planet. But we'll save that full explanation for an official solar system tour. All right, just going to take a couple more questions. I want to keep this too long. Let's see. Um, why can we only see one side of the moon? That's a great question, uh, Carolyn. Uh, well, the moon is what we call tidally locked. That means as it goes around the Earth, it's sort of always facing the Earth. Um, the reason for that is, uh, the main theory for the reason of that is based on how we think the moon was formed, likely by a very large object that crashed into the Earth and kind of 
um, broke part of the Earth off that eventually formed the moon. Um, and basically, tidally locking is actually very common. Many of the moons um, and natural satellites in our solar system are tidally locked with their planets. Um, and this is mostly because as um, as debris starts forming moons, just the 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 um, the interaction between the the pull of their home planet uh, and the formation of their mass um, kind of eventually will pull them into a state of tidally locking. It's kind of hard to explain just with my hands, um, but there are some great uh, videos you can look up on YouTube that explain that a little bit better. Um, so that's why the moon uh, always faces the Earth. Um, that's also why there's not a a dark side of the moon because the moon has its own day and nighttime cycle. There is a far side of the moon that always faces away from us, but that far side gets daytime as well. Um, all right. Okay, so we're, we've got a couple more questions, but we are actually going to uh, put a pen in this live stream for today, and we are going to save these great questions for next time. Um, I just wanted to say once again, thank you all for joining us uh, for this uh, live stream. And thanks for your patience as we kind of figure out the technology behind this. Um, myself and uh, the rest of the education team at Science City are really excited to start bringing you even more uh, content and more uh, educational activities and interactive components and interactive things that we can do with all of you from home uh, while we're uh, all uh, experiencing this, uh, this interesting, interesting time. Um, so thank you again for your patience. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to check out all the Instructables um, on the Facebook pages. Uh, make that planisphere, uh, that star map. And be sure to tune in next week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time. We'll be doing another live stream. And we'll announce uh, what the content for that will be, whether it'll be just a regular star tour or a full um, uh, solar system tour. And be sure to leave any more questions you have uh, on this video. Uh, and we'll save those for next time. And until then, hope you all stay safe. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Once again, y'all.